Hey guys, this is Ryan with The Smart House, and today I'm going to take you through some of the new features in Home Assistant Release 2021.04. Now, if you remember my last video that was on 2021.02, the major change was the movement of the Z-Wave integration from the original Z-Wave over to the new Z-Wave JS integration. Well, this month, they've upgraded that Z-Wave JS integration and added some new features that have been long asked for by users. And Changes and some other changes that have come in this release. There's also another great feature that's been added that will help you troubleshoot your automations that you've created in Home Assistant. Now, before I move on to those two new major features, let's look at what else is included in this April release. For a list of all these features, you can always visit the releases page, which I've linked below for this April release. Now, this April release has been titled for advanced users because this mostly focuses on topics that beginning users really won't be that interested in. However, I do think there's features that all levels of users will enjoy. Now, let me quickly go through some of the other high points in this month's release. Now, the first item I want to cover quickly is the changes to the database. Nothing really impacts you as the end user going forward for a new database. However, when you first upgrade to the April release, you will notice that there will be a longer delay bringing up the new version in Home Assistant. This is because in the background, Home Assistant is upgrading the current database version running on your Home Assistant instance. So please don't be alarmed if it takes a little bit longer for your Home Assistant to finish upgrading. It's just because the database version is being changed in the background. Now on my Home Assistant instance, I have a solid state drive, so I really didn't notice that big of a difference, but I did just upgrade it in the background, so it took about 10 minutes, I think. Next, we have the new analytics integration. Now, this is something that will allow the Home Assistant developers to see what versions of the Home Assistant software each user is running and also some of the plugins and additions they have on there. Now, this is completely opt-in and they've stated it's privacy focused. They will anonymize all of the data that they collect so that they can see just the rough analytical data and not specifics about your you or where you're instances installed. This will help the dev team to find out which versions or what plugins users are using and they can focus more closely on those things. So again, it's opt-in. So if you don't want to use it, feel free to leave it turned off, uh, but it will help the developer do turn on that integration. The next new feature that I'll point out is the template warnings. This feature will point out if you've added an element to a template that is either misspelled or not available. Uh, it'll pop up a little warning when you restart your Home Assistant instance that says, hey, you've got a element that has not been defined and you should go back and check it. That helps you if you miss a character or misspell a variable. That way you're not searching forever trying to figure out where that error comes in. It's very quick. It'll just tell you instantly that you've got an undefined variable in you. Now, the next part is the filtering on automations, scripts, and scenes. They've added in the feature in the corner now that you can basically check and filter out your automations, for example, by what devices it uses or areas that it involves or uh, or entity IDs that are being used in those particular automations or scripts. This is nice if you're like me and you're terrible at naming your automations and you can't remember which version of the automation you had that points to, say, the Office Chromecast. So this allows you to filter by Office Chromecast and find specifically which one of the automations or scripts use that particular one, making it easier to go back through and find what you're working on. And this last element was something that I found when I was just happened to be digging through trying to make some changes to an automation, the UI selectors for scenes and automations. So this allows you to go in and use a UI element to add additional features to say a script or an automation and similar to what's in the new blueprint features, which I haven't really dug into much, but allows you to basically use more building block type things instead of code. So you can go in and, and tag UI elements and also gives you at the bottom of each of the element uh, more description of what the, each of those ones are. You can always flip over to the YAML UI by clicking the button at the bottom. This allows you to do a better job of developing your automations and be able to tell what features are available for each item. Now, before I get into the two items that I'm the most excited about, I just want to remind you, if you haven't already, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I'm going to make an effort this year to put out more and better content. So if you're subscribed and you ring the bell, you'll be notified when I do upload new videos. Thank you in advance. Now let's look at what I feel are the two most significant features in this release. 
So one of the first features that caught my eye in this new release is the new automation debugging. One of the problems that I had with YAML based automations was debugging the issues. That's why I moved a lot of my automations over to Node Red. Well, after this release, I'm going to be moving some of my, some of my more complicated automations back over to the YAML so I can make changes to it in the mobile UI and use this new debugging feature. One thing of note is you won't be able to use the trace feature until you've ran an automation after the update. So say I just updated this morning and I had an automation that ran last night. I won't be able to view the trace data until after that runs again. So just be aware of that. That kind of caught me off guard the first time. All right, so here is all of my automations that I have in the built-in automation function in Home Assistant. So you can sort by last triggered and go into any of your automations that have ran since you've upgraded to 2021.04. Uh, and then you see this new history icon here, which is what allows you to trace an automation. So I don't really have any complicated automations in here that have ran recently, but you can click on any of these and then you'll see icons on the left here, which will tell you kind of what the trigger and then the result, uh, what each step did, what its, um, what its data, its output was, what variables changed, and also if there are any related logbook entries. So I'll go to this uh, automation here that I have that's uh, based on a remote that I can turn on or off. And what that will do is turn off a bunch of decorative lights I have in the house. So if I go to related logbook entries, you'll see all of the particular items that were turned off because of this automation. So it's really nice because you can go through and trace all sorts of different elements of the same automation and figure out if something failed, why it was exempted, why it didn't run, how long it took to run. Overall, I think it's going to be super powerful going forward to figure out why you have issues if you do have issues with automations. So like I said, kind of in the beginning of this, I think I'm going to bring a bunch of my node red automations back into the home assistant instance just so i have this feature which is really nice because node red really doesn't have that history i can go back and pull from now if you remember from my 202 video one of the major downsides of the new z-wave js integration was the lack of the ability to go in and make changes to each of your z-wave devices from the ui itself you had to either go to the physical device and make a change or you had to use the z-wave JS backend to make those changes. Good news, they've added that element into the UI in the Z-Wave JS integration. If we go into the Z-Wave JS integration, we won't notice much different. Uh, it all looks very similar to what it did before. If you click on a device that's compatible with the Z-Wave JS database, you'll be able to go and find extended information. So, if we, so this is my uh, bedroom fan, which is a uh, GE12730 fan controller. So if I click configure device, then you'll see I have a lot more options in here that I'd, I never had before. So I can invert the LED light. So the LED light on the switch itself is off when the switch is off or it's on when the switch is off. When the switch is off. Uh, invert the switch where the top turns it on, the bottom turns it off. Um, change all the dim rate, which doesn't really matter on this one, but it would on a regular switch. If I go here to say my bedroom overhead light and configure device, you, you know, I could change all of the various features, changing how much it changes per step so if i were to hold down on the button how much it changes per second uh if it the double tap what it does various things like that so you have a lot more granular control that before in the old z-wave integration you had that before but now you have that um, in the new z-wave js even in my lock configuration i can turn off the beeping sound i can turn off the lock and leave feature which is if it detects it being shut It'll automatically lock the door. And even some devices have different feature sets, like this Inavelli switch that I have in my bathroom. Um, I can change the color of the light on the LED. Um, I have the ability to auto off so it can run for so many seconds and turn off. Um, there's a lot more features. It all depends on which device you have and what feature set there is. Now, I do note that there are some devices here that don't have any extra features at all. So they're either not added or they're not currently supported. So if you do find something that isn't compatible, uh, I believe this one doesn't have anything. As you can see, this uh, this old Intermatic uh, light switch here or lamp module doesn't have any extended functionality. So um, there's a link here to the Z-Wave JS database, device database that will let you search through all of the compatible devices and what functions that it shows on each of them. Like if I went here to a home seer device, you'd be able to see all the different uh, functions that they support for configuration parameters and also how to include and exclude it. So this is a great little uh, database that's available for the Z-Wave JS integration. 
So I've seen a lot of great progress to this integration so far in the last two months since I've started using it. There's been bug fixes. They've added new devices that weren't functional before. So I had devices that I had already added that uh, say one of my light switches didn't work on the day that I installed the new integration. However, after a couple weeks of upgrades to the integration itself, those switches started working and I was able to uh, control them again. So I'm excited to see where the project goes from here. One of the items that I'm still struggling with are my two Z-Wave locks that I have. They were added to the Z-Wave stick from the previous integration. I just brought them forward to the Z-Wave JS, but I'm not able to see some of the extended data. Like for example, uh, who unlocked the lock, at what time, what the status of the lock is other than locked or unlocked. I know my, my front lock, which is a deadbolt, has the capability to tell me if it was locked from the thumb key or the button on the outside or via RF from the home assistant instance itself. But I'll be able to manage that. I might have to bring the <laughs> bring my Z stick really close to the lock to get that to function. Also be aware there are a few breaking changes that do affect Z-Wave JS and you can always find that by going to the releases page and scrolling down to the breaking changes section. I've linked it directly below here. One of the breaking changes was if you have a climate device, um, they're changing some of the naming schemes to be more consistent. So if you have a climate device like a thermostat, uh, you use the centralized scene events, or if you're using notification events, please make sure you check the breaking changes section under the Z-Wave JS at the bottom of the page. Okay, there you go. I hope this quick look at the new feature set of the April release of 2021 was helpful. If you'd like to see more videos where I kind of go through and review the new monthly releases, please let me know in the comments. I'd be happy to start doing that. Uh, I really like that they've started doing the releases monthly now, and that makes it a little bit slower, and it's not as much to catch up with every single month. Uh, as it was back in 2020. So I really appreciate the developers, all the hard work that they're putting into these new releases. I know it wasn't as fast with this video, but if it's something that you guys would like to see more of, I'd be happy to put that on my calendar and start doing that uh, more consistently. So if you found this video helpful, please make sure to give it a thumbs up. Like I said before, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. I've got some new reviews coming up. I've got some more information, some more videos to do with things like Tasker. Uh, I'm getting more into some, some API related items. So if you like those type of things, please make sure you're subscribed and ring the bell to get those notifications about new videos coming out in the next few weeks. Thank you again and have a great day.